helps maintain combat capability and should not and should help to guarantee that equipment is relevant and upgraded in a timely manner. This funding has enjoyed sustained bipartisan support both on this committee and throughout Congress. The Department of Defense and Congress have made substantial progress in terms of adequate funding for and reorganization of the reserve components, but I am concerned that these anticipated budgetary challenges we currently face could potentially negatively impact the current operational status of the Guard and Reserves. <clears throat> The ability to maintain a sustainable operational reserve force with sufficient operational capability is predicated on having sufficient manpower and adequate resources. I want to express how much the subcommittee appreciates the contribution of the Guard and Reserve components and want to recognize that they are maintained at a fraction of the cost of the regular military. We as a nation clearly cannot fight without them because there is no way a 19-year-old can have the skill set and experience of a 39-year-old. Before we begin, I would like to welcome well, the subcommittee's uh, newest member is not here, but let me tell you that uh, we are very pleased to have Kathy uh, Hochul from uh, New York, and when she comes, we will welcome her officially to our, uh, to our subcommittee. I would like now to turn to my good friend and colleague from Texas, Sylvester Reyes, for any comments that he might like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'd like to add my welcome to the panel, and uh, most especially to the three young men in the front row that... Uh, recently returned from, from Afghanistan. We appreciate your service and uh, thank you for joining us here today. Mr. Chairman, this past April, the subcommittee received testimony from the leadership of the Army and Air Force Reserve components. Today, we have th these same leaders back for an update on the equipment needs of the Army and Air Force Reserve. During the April hearing, we heard that our reserve components remain as busy as ever, that the proposed FY 2012 budget uh, request would allow us to maintain the high quality reserve forces that we have today. We also heard that there were additional equipment needs for all of our reserve components. As a result, the full Armed Services Committee bill included $325 million in additional funding uh, in the National Guard and Reserve Equipment uh, account. The House appropriators went even further, proposing an additional $1.5 billion for the same account with the Senate appropriators uh, proposing $500 million. So the good news is that it appears that Congress will continue to provide support to the Guard and, re and Reserve equipment needs over and above the budget request. On the other hand, however, the Budget Control Act of 2011 will likely result in a substantial cut to the DOD base budget in FY 2012, perhaps as much as $26 billion. In addition, the Budget Control Act mandates approximately $450 billion in additional DOD cuts over 10 years when it's compared to the current uh, DOD projections. And finally, if the so-called Super Committee does not reach its goal of $1.5 trillion in additional reductions, the DOD could face additional significant cuts starting in FY 2013. However, at this point, we don't know how DOD will propose dealing with these budget restrictions. What we do know, however, uh, is how similar cuts uh, have been applied in the past. In previous budget reductions, DOD has often taken an across-the-board approach to making cuts rather than a more focused, more thoughtful path. Uh, today, Mr. Chairman, I am concerned that if an across-the-board cookie-cutter approach to funding reductions takes place across the entire force, including our reserve components, uh, there will they will uh, incur significant uh, damage. For example, if the Air Force further reduces fighter aircraft fleets in the active duty force, will similar cuts flow down to the reserve components? If active duty forces are reduced by DOD, are there plans to increase the size of the reserve elements to compensate for those cuts? If DOD is seeking budget efficiencies, does it make sense to strategically expand some elements of the reserve forces? Uh, I certainly hope that, that those questions are being asked as part of the ongoing DOD strategic review. The nation has invested billions of dollars in additional funding to create the highly effective reserve forces that we have today. As you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, they, they've been more active than ever in the history of this country. With this subcommittee adding additional billions to that investment every year, to us, it just makes good and common sense. 
Beyond the immediate needs of our reserve components, I think it is also critical that we focus on the long term. If we get this right, we can end up with a high quality reserve force that also saves the nation billions of dollars, which at, in today's budget uh, uh, system desperately uh, may be needed elsewhere. So I look forward to hearing our witnesses' thoughts on these major issues uh, facing the entire DOD, but in particular, the reserve component uh, uh, is most critical uh, to get your input. With that, Mr. Chairman, I uh, uh, relinquish my time. Thank you very much. We will proceed with the panel's testimony uh, at this point. Without objection, all witnesses' prepared statements will be included in the hearing record. General Stoltz, please proceed with your opening remarks. Thank you, Chairman Bartlett, uh, Congressman Reyes, and other members of the committee. It's uh, truly an honor to be here today before you to, to testify. And I didn't plan this or orchestrate this, but I did find out that one of my units was at Fort Dix, New Jersey, just arriving back from Afghanistan. And some of the soldiers asked if they could come down just to sit in and listen to what goes on in the halls of Congress. And so I'm going to use them as an illustration uh, of why we have to do what we have to do, us and you together. I put one chart up here in front of you, and I think there's copies on your tables in front of you. But this question of whether or not we need an operational reserve, to me, is not a question. We have to have the reserve components as part of the operational force, and the reason we have to is because the Army is dependent on us. The, the chart there shows you that over time, as we've grown the active force from 480,000 to 569,000, we have continued to push more of the combat support, service support capability into the Guard and Reserve. Today, as the chart shows, 83% of the transportation capability of the Army is in the Reserve. 75% of the engineer capability of the Army is in the Reserve. 70% of the medical capability is in the Reserve, and I can go on and on. So it's not a matter of do we want to make the Reserve an operational force. We have to. We have to make it part of the operational force because we know the end strength of the Army is going to come down. And as the end strength of the active Army comes down, currently projected to come from 569 to 520, the Army is going to be even more dependent on the Guard and Reserve, which means we have to resource the reserve component as an operational force. And as you've indicated in your opening statements, it's a great return on investment. For what we, uh, you give us to invest in the reserve, we give you a great return. These soldiers sitting behind me are evidence of that. The soldiers here are out of the 744th Engineer Company of Ogden, Utah. First Lieutenant Tovey, I first met him in 2006 because I went out to Ogden, Utah to welcome home this unit when they came back from Iraq. They'd been out doing route clearance in the Anbar province. They'd taken a beating, lost soldiers in action, had a number of Purple Hearts that we handed out, Senator Bennett at the time and myself. And Sergeant Tovey helped me hand out coins. Sergeant Tovey got a direct commission to lieutenant. He's continuing his education today at Idaho State University, making a contribution back in his community, and now coming back from his deployment in Afghanistan. Sergeant Lissy, you look at him and you say, he's in a different uniform. Well, he's in a different uniform because during this deployment, he was severely wounded, shot through the leg and the bullet traveled up and almost through the spine. So he's been back home recovering but he wants to keep serving his country. And then Corporal Pratt. Corporal Pratt hasn't been in the Army very long. He enlisted in February of 2009, finished his training in 2010, and now he's a combat veteran back home in Utah. They have been doing route clearance. They remove the IEDs. They detect. They get out there. They are the lead in harm's way. The equipment they use in Afghanistan is the best the Army has. 
the training they got before they went to Afghanistan is the best the Army can give. The challenge we've got is that equipment is not sitting back in Ogden, Utah. The equipment sitting back in Ogden, Utah is not modernized equipment. The training we do on that equipment back in Ogden, Utah is not going to be the same level of training that we need to do for them to go back to Afghanistan or wherever we need them in the future. And the fact of the matter is, 75% of the Army's capability sits right here behind me and in the National Guard. It's not as if we've got another force out there to go to if we don't give them the equipment and the training they need. And so what we, together, you and I have to do is we have to band together, use the investments you give us wisely, modernize where we have to modernize, train where we have to train, and by God, we can't waste it. We can't afford to. Now, I've got one other chart I'd like to show you that I think is on your desk. And that is, this is what I call the dip chart. And these soldiers here illustrate what's on this chart. You see, when we first went to war in 2003, in the Army Reserve, we were almost 10,000 overstrength in soldiers. We were fat and happy, but we weren't trained and ready. And as we started trying to call the soldiers to the, to the front, we found out we had a lot of holes in our formation. We had a lot of medically unready soldiers. We had a lot of morally unready soldiers. We had a lot of soldiers on the rolls that we couldn't find. And then we had a lot of soldiers who said, this is not what I signed up for. And so by 2006, when I first came into this job, we were down to almost 20,000 under strength. And we lost that 10,000 over to 20 under while we recruited another 25,000 every year during that time period. So it wasn't just like we lost 30,000 soldiers. And then we started growing back. And we grew back to over 206,000 soldiers. And that was the Sergeant Lissies, the Corporal Pratts, the Lieutenant Tovies that joined our force. They joined our force to say, I want to go be something, I want to go do something. And they tell me three things. Give me some predictability because I've got another life and I got an employer or a school. Don't waste my time. Train me and train me to the standard I need to be trained to and hold me to that standard. And thirdly, use me. I didn't sign up to go back to a strategic reserve that's one week a month, one week in a month, two weeks in the summer. I want to be utilized. And that's what we're building the reserve of today around. And all we ask of Congress is help us get the resources we need to maintain this operational readiness we've got, to maintain this national treasure. Because if we don't, we'll repeat that dip chart one more time because these young men won't stick with us because they want to do something they want to be something they've got too much invested and they've got too much pride in what they're doing so my commitment to you sir is the resources you give me I'll invest in them I won't waste so I look forward to your questions thank you thank you very much General Carpenter Chairman Bartlett, Ranking Member Reyes, it's an honor and a privilege to again appear before this committee and represent the 360,000 plus soldiers of the Army National Guard. Currently we have almost 40,000 Army Guardsmen mobilized and deployed, and as you know, more than half of that force has combat experience. The sacrifice of our soldiers, their families and employers has been tremendous, and they deserve our deepest gratitude. And I, too, would like to acknowledge the service of the three soldiers uh, that General Stoltz has accompanying him today. Uh, coincidentally, I'm an engineer officer. Uh, these three soldiers are engineers. I've got to tell you, my connection with them as an engineer is, uh, is a very strong connection. And uh, I, think, I think those three soldiers could just as easily be from the Army National Guard. They could just as easily be from the active component because we are seamless now as an Army. And so thanks for your service, gentlemen. As I've noted before, the Army National Guard has been there from the start of this decade, from the very beginning. The New York National Guard was among the first on the scene at the World Trade Center on 
as was the Maryland and Virginia Guard in the days after the Pentagon was attacked. Beginning with the 9-11 response, the Army National Guard has continued to shoulder our responsibilities in the overseas fight in Afghanistan and Iraq, while simultaneously responding to events in the homeland, the largest of which was Hurricane Katrina. And the service of your Army National Guard continues. Let me illustrate with a snapshot in time, the weekend of August 26th through the 29th. During that weekend, the National Guard had more than 63,000 National Guardsmen on duty protecting this country at home and abroad. Over 47,500 National Guardsmen were deployed in support of overseas contingency operations and partnership building missions. Almost 10,000 members of the National Guard from 24 states were responding to then Hurricane Irene. Another 1,000 National Guardsmen provided security on our nation's southwest border, and an additional 4,000 National Guardsmen responded to a range of domestic emergencies across this country. The experience of the past decade has transformed the Army National Guard into an operational force, a national treasure in the words of a recently retired four-star active duty general. As an operational force, the Army National Guard represents the best value for America. Force structure and military power can be sustained in the Army National Guard for a fraction of the regular cost. The Army National Guard is one-third of the total Army, but accounts for approximately 10 percent of the total Army budget. Supporting capability in the Army National Guard is not only the right thing to do, it makes good business sense. The Army National Guard could not have evolved into the operational force we are without the support of Congress. Our nation has invested over $37 billion in equipment for the Army National Guard in the past six years, much of that from the Negri account. The delivery of that equipment has increased Army National Guard equipment on hand rates for critical dual use equipment by 14 percent. Because the Army National Guard is a full partner with the active component, it is vital for the Guard to continue modernizing its equipment. Modernization and interoperability are essential for training during the Army National Guard pre-mobilization periods and critical for deployments, as General Stultz has pointed out. I know this committee is interested in what has changed since our appearance here last spring. Simply put, it's the budget. Inside the Army, we have worked through multiple iterations of budgets based upon the latest proposed budget reduction. Secretary Panetta said on Tuesday that we would face difficult choices. He also cautioned that we should make budget choices based on strategy rather than expediency. He also suggested that modernization, weapon systems, and maintenance programs were being examined as part of spending cuts, and specifically, contracts were being reviewed for savings. We in the Army Guard understand that future funding will be less than in the past. And frankly, we are prepared to shoulder our proportional share of the burden. <coughs> To that end, we have already set about garnering efficiencies and developing new strategies that will allow us to continue to meet our dual mission responsibility with less funding. Those two missions have required an Army National Guard of 360,000 soldiers, 54 Joint Force Headquarters, 8 Combat Divisions, 28 Brigade Combat Teams, 8 Combat Aviation Brigades, and over 70 Enabling Brigades over the past 10 years. We are reminded regularly that we live in a very dangerous and unpredictable world, and it seems like the predicted 100-year natural disaster events are coming closer and closer together. We have built a capability to respond to the needs of our citizens home and abroad. We ought to, be, we ought to fully understand the risk associated with reducing that capability. Because in the words of a combat commander in Afghanistan, sometimes all it takes is all you have. The Army National Guard is a force forward deployed in our area of operation, the homeland. We have built great capacity in the National Guard by establishing forces specifically designed to deal with emergencies, disasters, and potential terrorist attacks. Those units include Guard Civil Support Teams, CBRNE Emergency Response Forces, Homeland Response Forces, and Domestic All-Hazards Response Teams. By one estimate, 96 percent of the events that happen across our country on a daily basis are handled by the local first responders, the policemen, the firemen, and the National Guard. 
Only 4% require federal support. It has taken years to build these organizations. We should not rush to reduce the size, structure, or capability of the Army National Guard without significant analysis and thorough deliberation. I think it's very important to note that eliminating a soldier from the Army National Guard is a double hit because you not only take a soldier out of the war fight, you also take a soldier out of the emergency response team at home. In the end, we have asked the Arm that the Army Guard share of the budget reductions be given to us, the Army National Guard, and let us figure out where to pay the bill. Don't direct reductions in brigade, Guard Brigade combat teams or end strength, because when that happens, we will be forced to close armories, move out of communities, and be driven to a lower readiness level. Consistent with Secretary Panetta's comments, we think we can examine our contracts and our programs and become more efficient while maintaining our end strength and our force structure. In closing, the Army National Guard is battle-tested and well-equipped for both of our missions. And this committee has been critical in building and sustaining the best manned, best trained, and best equipment National Guard I've seen in my career truly a best value for America. Again, and it is my privilege and honor to appear before this committee today, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. General Wyatt. Chairman Bartlett and uh, Ranking Member Reyes, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today on behalf of the 106,700 Air National Guardsmen, uh, combat proven, dedicated professional men and women uh, serving around the world. I thank you and all members of the committee for your support, continuing support in these challenging times. As we sit here today, over 6,000 Air National Guardsmen are deployed around the world and helping to defend U.S. interests on every continent, including Antarctica. In addition, nearly 3,500 Air National Guard men and women are helping to protect our homeland by protecting the air sovereignty of the American airspace, flying the Aerospace Control Alert ACA mission also by assisting civil authorities in the protection of life and property in the United States, including assisting flood and hurricane recovery efforts in the Midwest and in the Northeast. Air Guard members are currently helping the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol secure our southern borders. And this summer, Air National Guard aerial firefighting units dropped over 360,000 gallons of fire retardant on wildfires across the Southwest in support of the National Forest Service. For the last 20 years, the Air National Guard has been at war alongside our Air Force Reserve and regular Air Force brothers and sisters. When the air campaign of Operation Desert Storm began in January of 1991, 11% of the U.S. Air Force aircraft were flown and maintained by Guard airmen. And the men and women of the Air National Guard have continued to answer the call to service ever since, adapting rapidly to the changing demands of the post-Cold War security environment. Today. The Air National Guard provides approximately 34 percent of the total Air Force capability at a fraction of the Air Force total budget. As we look to the many challenges ahead, my goal is to lay the foundations for an Air Force that has the capability and the capacity to meet tomorrow's challenges within the constraints that we can foresee. As you know, the Air National Guard relies on the Air Force for major modernization initiatives and weapons systems procurement. However, we work with the Air Staff to encourage them to equip the Air Guard in a manner that is concurrent and balanced with the active component, because I believe that if the Air National Guard is going to continue to be a reliable partner, able to integrate seamlessly into Air Force joint operations, it must have the equipment that is equal to the task and compatible with our Air Force Reserve <coughs> and active duty partners. The funds that Congress provides directly to the Air National Guard via the National Guard and Reserve Equipment Appropriations, the NGRIA account, have made a significant impact on our ability to support both the warfighter and civil authorities. We strive to use these funds as efficiently as possible by pursuing lower cost 80 per, 80 percent solutions to the immediate needs of our warfighters at about 25 percent of the cost. Needs that are identified directly by our warfighters and first responders uh, out of our weapons and tactics uh, uh, classes. Your investment through NGRIA has been a critical component to the Air Guard. Uh, increased readiness. For example, without NGRIA, the Block 30 F-16, the backbone of protecting America's skies, would be irrelevant today. 
Given the future budget uncertainty, we have shifted INGRIA focus in FY12 to ensure we finish as many existing modernization initiatives as possible to avoid a, a, expensive and disruptive production breaks uh, should the amount of INGRIA be substantially reduced. Ladies and gentlemen, you have created the most professional combat ready force in the history of the Air National Guard. Today's Guard Airmen understand that the nation needs more of them than one weekend a month and two weeks in the summer, and they are willing to answer the call. All that they ask is that we continue to provide them with the equipment, training, and resources they need to accomplish the mission. If I could share with you an experience this morning that kind of puts all of this in perspective, uh, I had the honor and privilege going to Arlington and attending uh, the services of Specialist Christopher Horton. Uh, a sniper uh, with the 45th Infantry Brigade Combat Team, Oklahoma Army National Guard. Uh, I knew this young man because he signed up to join the 45th when I was the Adjutant General of the State of Oklahoma. He was killed in action in Afghanistan on September 9th this year, along with two other members of the Oklahoma Army National Guard when they were caught in an ambush. I thought about other Oklahomans that were serving in harm's way today. My old 138th fighter wing, F-16 wing out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, currently flying combat missions in Iraq, trying to prevent happen uh, what happened to uh, Specialist Horton and his compatriots, trying to prevent that from happening. That F-16 unit would not be able to do the combat operations that it's doing today, protecting people on the ground, had it not been for the INGRI accounts that allowed us to develop the targeting pods that those aircraft carry today. That's the importance of the INGRI account. We're, we have a tendency, as we meet here today, to talk about resources and talk about modernization and talk about funds and talk about equipment, talk about stuff. But when it comes down to it, what we're really talking about is providing the equipment, the training, uh, the resources that our young men and women, regardless of service and regardless of component, need when they go into combat. That's the importance of why these gentlemen are here today and why all of you are here today. It's an honor and privilege to be here, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. And now General Stenner. Chairman Bartlett, Ranking Member Reyes, Committee Members, thank you for inviting me to appear before you today. I'm here to report that the Air Force Reserve continues to be seamlessly integrated with the active component and the Air National Guard to complete all of the Air Force missions we are assigned. We accomplish this while continuing to provide a cost-effective and combat-ready force available for strategic surge and ongoing daily operations. My written testimony outlines our modernization strategy and priorities. Today, I'd like to discuss the profound impact NAGRIA funding has on our force readiness. But first, let me take the opportunity to introduce and thank Chief Master Sergeant Dwight Badgett. As the Air Force Reserve Command Chief for the past two and a half years, Chief Badgett has served as my senior enlisted advisor. He will be departing Air Force Reserve Command to join Northern Command's Joint Task Force North as the senior enlisted leader. There is no better example of jointness and total force than the selection of this highly capable and well-qualified chief to this post. Chief, thank you for your continued service. The Air Force Reserve has never had a more seasoned and capable force, equipped to support missions around the globe. Our contributions range from the training of our institutional forces in associations in basic military training and pilot and navigator training, to our continued involvement in joint and coalition combat operations and humanitarian airlift operations abroad. Just a quick outline to the left here on this chart is as a percentage of what the total Air Force does is what we as an Air Force Reserve bring to this fight. And I know my partner in the Air National Guard has a chart similar to that. And when you put those two Air Reserve components together, you have a very powerful piece what the Air Force brings to this nation's defense. We have also expanded our efforts in cyber, remotely piloted aircraft, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance based on Air Force and combatant commander requirements. The nation depends on us, and it is therefore crucial that we continue to provide that force with the equipment, the training, and the resources they need to accomplish the missions that we have been asked to execute. The National Guard and Reserve Equipment Account is absolutely vital to the way the Air Force Reserve operates today. It impacts every facet of our operational readiness and is the primary means of ensuring the Air Force Reserve is equipped with the most relevant, modern, and compatible fielded technologies, preserving our combat capability on a cost-efficient basis. Since 1982, 
NAGRIA has allowed the Air Force Reserve to upgrade our operational equipment with better targeting, self-protection, and communication capabilities, all of which have proven to be critical time and again to supporting operations wherever we are called to serve around the globe. For more than 29 years, NAGRIA-funded programs tested and recommended for fielding by the Air National Guard and Air Force Reserve Command Test Center have resulted in multiple weapon systems and equipment being fielded to frontline operators through system program offices that support the total force warfighter. Current levels of NAGRIA and supplemental funding have allowed the Air Force Reserve to make significant strides in meeting urgent warfighter requirements. For example, NAGRIA made possible state-of-the-art avionics upgrades unique to the Air Force Reserve and Air National Guard F-16 Block 30 weapon systems, a highly sought-after sought capability during Operation Enduring Freedom. Today, as another example with NAGRIA funding, we're saving lives. A tool called the Smart Multifunction Color Display provides air combat search and rescue helicopters, the, the HH-60Gs, PAVOCs, with enhanced data link and situational awareness capabilities. In less than 20 months from contract award, the display was in use by tactical units in Afghanistan. This NAGRIA effort directly contributed to saving 331 lives with 268 assists during Operation Enduring Freedom. Air Force Reserve NAGRIA funding of at least $100 million per year will permit us to start modernization initiatives vital to maintaining our combat edge and to complete ongoing efforts that are essential to continuing our effective contributions to the total force and its wartime missions. Properly equipping the Air Force Reserve preserves our capacity to continue providing forces as an operational reserve. The work of this committee, especially its consideration of reserve component modernization efforts, is essential to our support of joint and coalition operations. Thank you for your work, and again, thank you for asking me here today to discuss these important issues affecting the readiness of our airmen and our equipment. I look forward to your questions. Thank you all very much. As is my usual uh, policy, I will reserve my questions until the end, hoping that they will all have been asked by my colleagues. Mr. Reyes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your testimony here this afternoon. In your written testimony, all four of you mentioned that reserve components offer a uh, more cost-effective way to maintain and deploy military capabilities. In fact, uh, in some of the percentages that you cited uh, were very, uh, very impressive. But from time to time, uh, on the active duty side, uh, others say otherwise, uh, specifically pointing out to the, uh, the, the high training cost for deploying reserve forces. So I have uh, three questions, and for all of you. Does the DOD have an agreed upon baseline to use uh, in comparing the cost of reserve versus active duty forces. The second question is, what is your view uh, of the right numbers that should be used to, com to compare? And then should we look at the third one, should we look at the overall cost per service member or compare similar units to each other? Yes, sir, I'll, I'll lead off. Um, to answer your first uh, question, no, sir, I don't think we have a, an agreed-to number. I know there's a number of studies out there, and part of the re challenge we have in identifying what's the agreed-to number are it's not just paying allowances, and it's not just training days associated with it. Uh, we have to pay into uh, accruals for medical and, and retirement. And because our retirement system is deferred, we don't draw retirement and we don't become eligible to age 60, it is a lower accrual rate, which in fact says an, a reserve soldier on active duty actually costs less than an active duty soldier on active duty because the accruals are lower. Not everybody agrees with, well, we don't count it that way. My reserve soldiers don't live on an installation and all the costs associated with funding and installation and everything that goes with that, they, they drill in a reserve center, which is a much lower piece of a facility to operate. But again, a lot of the cost models say, well, we don't consider that when we're looking at it. So I think part of the challenge we got is trying to get everybody to agree is what really does a soldier cost us? And what are all the things that go with it? 
Uh, so, no, we don't have. Now, the second thing I would tell you is in the cost analysis we've run on the Army Reserve, the cost of an Army Reserve so soldier today to get him deployed to Afghanistan, I'll tell you, the cost of deploying the 744th today versus the cost of the, deploying the 744th back in 2004 and 2005 is much lower. And the reason is the chart right here. In 2003, 2004, we weren't ready. And so most of the units mobilizing in the Army Reserve took 60, 90, 120 days just to get trained, which only left us six or seven months of boots on the ground time. And so in the cost analysis, when you use those figures, you say, oh, yeah, I need two of these for every year because I only get six months out of them. The cost of deploying this unit today is much less because I'm able to train and deploy most of the reserve units in the Army Reserve in 30 days or less because they're combat seasoned, uh, they're already trained in a lot of their skill sets, and they come together very quickly and we're able to push them out. So now we get 10 to 11 months boots on the ground time out of them versus six or seven that we used to. So that reflects the right side of that chart that says here's a trained and ready force, and once you get it trained and ready, it is much more cost effective because you don't have to invest as much up front as long as you maintain what you've already got. And so our figures come out somewhere around a third of the cost. And then the third thing we've said is if we're going to train and, and get this force as an operational force, we don't necessarily have to utilize it in the future for 12 months at a time and 100% of the force. We can take an engineer battalion, and I can go to a combatant command like AFRICOM or SOUTHCOM, and I can say, let me give you the, the battalion that the 744th belongs to, but here's what I want you to do. Just use one company at a time for 90 days and go do humanitarian, do, build schools, build medical clinics, do things like that. And these gentlemen back here go to El Salvador or Panama or Ethiopia or Uganda, Kenya for a 90-day rotation followed on by their sister company out of Pocatello, followed on by their sister company out of Crater Lake. And we use the entire battalion during the year, but we only pay 25% of it at a time. So the model I've got for the use of the reserve for the future is very cost-effective. And I think we're still going to have the challenges on coming to the right number. What is the right number? But I can tell you, whatever the right number is, it's much lower in the reserve components than our active counterparts. Congressman, uh, first of all, I'd like to point out that each one of the three components has a role to play in the total Army. Uh, we in the National Guard have two missions, uh, the Homeland Mission and the Federal Mission. The active component has a primary mission for being the first response uh, in terms of a national requirement, and General Stoltz's force is uh, providing the majority of enablers in most cases as that active force goes downrange. So nobody should think uh, that there's a cost savings to be had across the entire force by turning us into a purely reserve or purely a National Guard organization. That's not, that's not the discussion at all. On the surface of it, though, you have to accept the fact that when the National Guard only takes up 10 percent of the budget, we are definitely a lesser cost organization from a reserve standpoint. One third of the cost is the calculation that we've got as we look across the pay and allowance and the costs associated with having a unit in the reserve in the National Guard. There's no question as we go towards mobilization that that cost rises and we get close to 100 percent, close to the same parity as our active component counterparts. But to General Stoltz's comment about the operational force, uh, for a very modest investment, we can sustain the combat edge, sustain the training uh, proficiency that we have garnered here in this operational for force courtesy of the last 10 years uh, at war. And so our pitch to the active Army and to the Department of Defense is it would make good sense to invest in this operational force and for a modest amount to be able to sustain that. In terms of the right numbers, uh, I think that uh, 
In the discussions we've had with the Army, the Army recognizes uh, the metric that I just described to you. Overall, uh, the cost per service member uh, in comparison, uh, you know, in some cases it depends on whose figures you're relying on and what all is factored into it. But in the final analysis, there's no question that the Army National Guard and the Army Reserve are a great investment for this country and provide a huge bang for the buck. Congressman Reyes, the, uh, the question you ask is an interesting one, and uh, I, would, uh, I would agree with my contemporaries here that uh, I don't think the Department of Defense has an agreed upon uh, uh, computation. Uh, there are lots of studies out there. Uh, I would uh, suggest that it would uh, behoove all of us to ask questions of the analysts that try to answer that question uh, and to consider the source of those analysts. Uh, I gave up a long time ago trying to out-analyze uh, the active duty in the United States Air Force because they, they outnumber me. They got a lot of PhDs and they're A-9, and I don't even have an A-9, you know. Uh, we, are, we have 98 percent, 98.5 percent of Air National Guardsmen are in warfighting UTCs. Uh, our core competency is not analysis. Our core competency is not weapons development. Our core competency is not acquisition. Those are all core competencies of the United States Air Force that adds to the cost of the active component. I recognize that. But when you compare the cost of a warfighter to the cost of a warfighter active in reserve, I prefer to look to, look to sources of information that are not active duty and not Air National Guard. If you, if you consider uh, the Government Accountability Office on military personnel, they say the relationship is one-sixth the cost an Air National Guardsman costs one-sixth as much as an active component. The Office of the Undersecretary of Defense uh, says about one-fourth. The uh, Heritage Foundation says about one-sixth. Uh, the Commission on the National Guard and Reserve said that they looked at all the studies that were out there, and while they all varied a little bit, they were all consistent in that uh, Guardsmen and Reservists uh, cost less, it's in, especially if you consider the life cycle. Now, if you took all 106,700 of my Air National Guardsmen and you put them, you call them to Title 10 service and you put them all on active duty at the same time, yes, they would cost as much and perhaps maybe a little bit more than the active component uh, because we do uh, need to train up a little bit, not much because the Air Force already funds the Air National Guard to organize, train, and equip to the same standards as the active duty Air Force. Uh, so we don't need uh, the boost in training to get to that level that the Air Force expects us to have. Our doc statements, our description of capability statements in the Air National Guard for our units requires the same response time, the same level of, of, of response as the active component. So when we say that uh, the, Air, the Air National Guard provides 34 percent of the uh, Air Force warfighting capacity, that's what we're talking about. And if you look at our budget compared to the total Air Force budget, it's about 6 percent. We think that's cost effectiveness. Congressman, I do have an A-9. They do analysis, but I quit dueling, dueling data. It doesn't help. My baseline, and your first question went to what is the agreed upon baseline, do we have one? Mine is intuition. First of all, if you're only paying somebody when they're actually being used, Intuitively, they're cheaper than somebody that's being paid 100 percent of the time. So the next trick is, is it a third, is it a quarter? doesn't matter, it's less. And to your next question, what are the right numbers, it goes to balance. Every single mission has got to be looked at, in my opinion. Uh, what is the requirement for strategic depth? How much do you need in reserve? And then how much is the combatant commander requiring of you? How much then do we need for the active force? And we put the rest of it in in the Air Force anyway, Guard and Reserve as appropriate by mission set. So there's a balance in each mission, and there is no real template that you can go across all the missions and say this is right. The Mobility Air Forces, we have a significant portion of that, both the Guard and Reserve on a daily basis, and we are paid for when we uh, operate those airplanes around the world and not paid for when we're not operating those airplanes around the world. Lastly, uh, it's by mission set with the balance, and Air Force Reserve and Air National Guard, in my opinion, are the catcher's mitt for folks who, in fact, make a life-changing decision and decide that they need to move to a, 
a reserve or guard component, and I want to give them the opportunity to serve in a part-time capacity because there's huge costs included in retraining somebody. It takes how long to replace a 10-year staff sergeant? 10 years, huge training costs. I want to keep that training, that trained individual in our uh, reserve component to ensure that they're there when the nation needs them. Capture them, comparing that to the training costs, we are definitely a cheap and effective and efficient, I don't say cheap, effective and efficient, cost effective way to do business. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for a good question and, a, uh, and good responses. Mr. Loviando. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for being here and uh, thank you all for your service to our country. General Wyatt, we have had some discussions in the past and um, I was hoping you could provide us with your best professional military opinion on the issue of replacing F-16 Block 30 fighter jets within the Air National Guard. I understand that the Air Force has always stated their commitment to ensuring that the Air National Guard has the iron necessary to perform critical missions. However, has the Air Force presented you with a formal plan uh, for dealing with the timeline and the numbers that you can expect to recapitalize your fighters over the next five to ten years? And I, and I ask this question because I believe uh, you don't have a plan unless it's on paper. So people can talk about a lot of different things, but that changes. And uh, this committee, I think, really needs to have a better understanding of the path going forward because as we enter a new climate of defense spending, uh, we really need to understand the justification for decisions before they happen, not after they happen. And additionally, as the F-35 keeps slipping to the right, I think this is going to have a huge effect on swapping out our aging Air National Guard fighters. And I, I'd really appreciate your comments on this. Thank you, sir. Um, you know, we, we have had a, a discussion before about the, the age of the Block 30s, uh, F-16s in the Air National Guard. Um, the Air Force has committed some money for structural uh, sustainment that will uh, buy two to three more years of life. But uh, you're, you're correct. In the next uh, 10 years, uh, these aircraft will age out. Some of them will start aging out before then. Uh, there are a lot of different options. Uh, flow down of Block 40 F-16s, flow down of Block 50 F-16s from the active component to the guard as the F-35 is bedded down on active duty, bedding down the active duty with F-35s uh, uh, in those units that performed uh, uh, ACA so that they could do not only the air sovereignty, the aerospace control alert mission, but also the AEF rotations overseas as they do. Um, but I think your question went to, has the Air Force shown you a written plan that shows you the numbers of aircraft, the types of aircraft in the years that they will flow to the Air National Guard to replace the old Block 30 F-16s? Is that your question? Yes, sir. The answer is no, sir, they have not. I have not seen that plan yet. Um, so uh, th this is this kind of trouble. Have you, um, have you requested, have you made a request for a formal plan? Yes, sir, I, I have. Uh, we began requesting uh, a couple of years ago uh, when I first, uh, well, a little over two years ago when I first uh, uh, became the director, and we have been making some progress. Uh, I've seen some, some uh, general uh, plans, but nothing that would show uh, me, for example, uh, how many jets may be coming to the Air National Guard in the next three or four years to replace uh, an aging out aircraft. That's the type of detail that we would really need to be able to go forward to determine whether or not we are going to be recapitalized, but I have not seen that plan yet, sir. Well, um, Mr. Chairman, I, you, you've been good on this, uh, Chairman Bartlett, and I would, um, uh, I'd like to think that this is a critical issue for, um, for the entire committee, but especially this subcommittee, and that uh, I would hope, um, Mr. Chairman, that we could find ways to um, address directly with the Air Force leadership. Um, we've been posing this question now for a number of years. Um, we keep getting a sort of a dodge and weave on this, and uh, at a certain point we're going to run out of time to be able to make accommodations if we need to do that. 
Um, I think it's critical given the integration that the Air Guard has had with the full Air Force, uh, what they're doing being deployed in the war against terrorism. And um, I, would, I would hope I could work with you directly on this matter to get a more substantial answer that we could put our arms around and decide whether they actually have a plan or they're just giving us lip service. Thank you very much. I concur with your concerns, and I will be happy to join you in a uh, uh, request for uh, clarification of, of this to the appropriate people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sangas. Thank you all for your testimony and for your service. I, um, I represent a district in which many members of the Guard and Reserve have gone to serve in Afghanistan and Iraq and um, see their extraordinary professionalism, the tremendous training that you have put in place so that they can do the tasks they're handed and the various wounds that they sustain as a result of their deployment. So I just want to thank you and the fine young men who are with you today for, for your for great work on behalf of our country. And we're all looking at uh, the budget cuts that uh, we are facing as a nation and uh, the Defense Department obviously having to absorb a significant portion of them, but we also want to be very thoughtful and careful, and so I appreciate uh, your testimony today. I have a question about the quad Quadrennial Defense Review. I am curious as to whether or not it provides a constructive template for future employment of the operational force uh, that you have worked so hard to develop it, develop, and what impact will the Budget Control Act of 2011 and the possibility of sequester, if we cannot come to an agreement, have on some of the QDR's underlying assumptions with regards to the Guard and Reserves? And I take an answer from any and all of you. Well, I'll lead off and I'll try to make it concise, but I, I think the QDR provides a framework for the Army in terms of the role of the Army or the land component. And that in turn, if you want to call it trickle downs, but it shapes what kind of capability we need to have in the reserve to support the role of the land component. And then I think the QDR also defines what we need to protect our nation back home, our own soil, and respond to our, our disasters back here. And, and I know there's legislation that's uh, being put in place today to allow the Title X Reserve to be more of a homeland capability, not to get involved with the National Guard because they do, and as Ray indicated, 90, 95% of the time everything is fine and handled at the state level. But when it comes to we need the federal force to help us, today we revert to the active component. When in many cases there's a reserve unit Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, right there in your state with the capability you need, but legally we can't touch them. So we're pushing that and we appreciate your support to say, let us be part of the solution and let the QDR help us shape that. Now for the second part of your question, I think it could be devastating, ma'am. I think it could be devastating if we go forward into the sequester because it's going to force cuts across the, the military. And I think it could lead, one, to parochialism because they're going to be fighting for aircraft while I'm fighting for soldiers because we're all in it. And we're not fighting because we're, you know, too protective or jealous. We're fighting because we say our nation's security is at risk. And if we allow that to go forward in the cuts we have, can I do what needs to be done to protect this nation? Can I produce the 205,000 soldiers that the Army needs with all the capabilities I listed before, or am I going to not have the equipment, not having the training days, not having anything, and we go back to a 9-11-2001 stance with our reserve, which is a hollowed-out strategic force. So I think if we let these budget cuts go forward to the level that they could, it could have a devastating impact on our national security. Uh, Congresswoman, a couple of observations. Uh, the 2010 QDR was actually a study that was done in 2009, reported out in 2010. We find ourselves now in 2011 about ready to go into 2012. The reason why we do a quadrennial defense review every four years is because things change. And our, as uh, Secretary Gates observed, uh, our ability to predict the future uh, 
we we have been a hundred percent wrong in uh, across the board and so what we saw in the analysis in 2009 in terms of uh, what the world looked like uh, pre uh, Arab Spring pre budget issues uh, those kinds of things are not factored into the QDR that we see now in 2010 one of the things that uh, the QDR did represent, however, was the building of Homeland Response Forces, uh, which we are currently in process doing. And uh, we validated two of those ten last year, and we're about ready to validate another eight. It did recognize uh, the responsibility to minimize the risk in the homeland and to try and uh, make sure that we would prevent and deal with any terrorist attacks uh, on our own soil. Uh, that, that is an enduring requirement. Uh, I think that as you as you look at uh, where we're at right now with regard to uh, the relationship that we have inside the Army, the three components of the Army, and the budget issues that are out there, I agree with uh, the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of the Army, the Chief Staff of the Army, in their observation that if we end up having to take the reductions that are out there, it will decimate the uh, Department of Defense. And as you take a broader view, even if you dedicated the entire Defense Department budget against the requirement we've got out there, it wouldn't solve, it wouldn't be the solution, uh, because it's a much larger problem than inside the Department of Defense. It's going to take a shared sacrifice here to get us back into uh, a configuration where we uh, can sustain the economy we've got right now. And so, uh, to Secretary Panetta's comment about we ought to take a strategic view of this rather than be expedient, I think that's exactly the right course. You know, uh, we, we talk about efficiencies, we talk about doing more with less, we talk about being lean and mean and moving uh, tail to tooth, all these expressions. Uh, I would submit to you that the, uh, uh, the Air National Guard has uh, has been lean and mean before lean and mean was cool. Uh, we were efficient before efficiency was cool. We had to because of the nature of our force. We uh, uh, often fall below the, the resourcing line, uh, and I understand that because the, de the uh, demands uh, of our Air Force are, are such that a lot of times the resources aren't enough to, uh, to pay for what the country expects the Air Force to do. Uh, the Air Force Reserve and the Air National Guard play a big part of that. Uh, so all this, this talk recently about, well, we need to become more efficient, I, I agree we need to continue trying to find efficiencies, but in the Air National Guard, uh, I think we've sple squeezed just about all the blood out of this turnip that we can squeeze. We're at the point now that uh, uh, any further uh, reductions, uh, cuts, uh, drawbacks will adversely affect our readiness. Um, you know, I'm committed not to sending airmen into harm's way unless they are fully trained, uh, fully equipped, uh, very capably led, and we won't back off that standard at all. Uh, so when you combine the, the two of those, uh, the only thing I could say is that we may need to start taking a look at uh, not doing some of those missions that the QDR uh, laid out for the United States Air Force to do. It's a decision that will be made way above my pay grade, but uh, as far as the Air Guard is concerned, uh, I think we're at that point right now. Your first question was, did the QDR provide a template? And Ma'am, no such thing. There were several different scenarios, different sets of conditions uh, that we were looking at and, and attempting to understand. And as General Carpenter has said, we've, we've moved on to something that now is a fiscal reality. And regardless of which piece of QDR you look at, the Air Force Reserve needed to be and must be, would have been a part of every single one of those in, in solution set in force sizing. And that's the, that's the real trick, is what's the force sizing construct that we're looking at right here, and how do we handle that major combat operation and still be able to do the rotational force we're doing on a daily basis with the contingencies around the world and make sure we continue to be able to train and continue to be ready for either of those other two conditions. That now is, is couched in fiscal reality. And to your second question, your second comment, sequester, when I, when I go back to what I just said and I, I apply sequester to the force sizing that we are trying very hard to figure out and the balance we're trying to figure out, 
There is no strategic look at sequester, and we will absolutely destroy some piece of the mission that we didn't intend to do uh, without a strategic discussion, and not just within the Air Force, but likely across the services. Thank you. Mr. Runyon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you all for your testimony, and thank you for your service. Um, a question for all of you. Specifically, I know on the Army side we've talked a lot about personnel, but from an uh, equipment perspective and the ability to do all your missions compared equipment-wise to pre-9-11 to now, as so we know that active duty a lot of times is taking the equipment you have and your ability to uh, train your troops to the level they need to be trained. Yes, sir. We, we have, thanks to Congress, giving us the appropriations they have and the NGREA funds that we've been able to to get and, and apply. Our equipping posture in the Army Reserve is better than it has been in history. However, it's not where we need it to be. And, and the challenge we've got is you can look and say we're at 91 percent of our authorized equipment on hand. We're in pretty good shape. The problem is we're at about 67% modernized. It's equipment that's a substitute for the modern equipment. And more importantly, when you get into some of the critical pieces of equipment, the figure says you're at 90% on hand, but actually it's 29% modernized or 25% modernized. And why is that important? Well, the importance is what I said earlier about this route clearance unit. They need that modernized equipment back home to train on because that's what they're going to be expected to operate when they get to Iraq, Afghanistan, or wherever the next call is. We need the modernized equipment because the modernized equipment has the ability to put add-on armor. You see, I've got probably 90 percent of my Humvee fleet, but only 15 percent of it can have add-on armor. So it's not really practical for use in a IED environment that we can counter. I would have to be dependent of somebody else giving me the equipment. A lot of my 915 line haul trucks that I've got that haul all the containers that moved everything into Iraq and move a lot of stuff around Afghanistan are the old models that aren't add-on armor capable. We use what we call ghetto armor. We just slap what we can on there to protect them. We need the 915 a A5s, which are the modernized cab that allows you to put an A or a B kit depending on what level of threat is out there. And just as you know in your district, sir, Fort Dix, New Jersey is one of our premier training platforms. That's where all the soldiers we have, active, guard, uh, and reserve, in a lot of cases, go through there in their training getting ready to go to theater. And we need that equipment sitting there at Fort Dix as a training set so that I don't have to pay to transport a piece of equipment up there for the unit to train on and then transport it back home to them to be back in their motor pool. So this, this, the, to me, the bill out there is the modernization effort. To get the Army Reserve today to 100% modernized, 100% of everything we have and 100% modernized is about an $8.9 billion bill that's still out there. Uh, and that's because equipment has continued to change, and that's because units have, co have continued to change, but we can't stop. We've got to be effective and efficient in how we use it. If I'm going to outfit a heavy transport truck company with 96 hats, I don't need 96 sitting in their motor pool back in Las Vegas, Nevada, but I need 96 sitting at Fort Hunter Liggett probably so they can train on them, and for sure I need 96 modernized hats to go with them where they go in theater. So the modernization to me is much more important than the own hand figure that we quote. General Wyatt, do you have anything? I'm sure you have similar concern in the Air Force. Uh, I, I do, sir. You know, we, uh, we face the same issue in the Air National Guard that uh, General Stenner does in the Air Force Reserve and the active duty does. It, and, and that's it. We've got a lot of old stuff out there. You know, fighters that are 25 going on 30 years old tankers that are over 50 years old, uh, and so we have this recapitalization challenge. We know in the Air National Guard that uh, uh, unless uh, we go, and the Air Force goes with concurrent and balanced recapitalization across the total force, uh, that we are 
in the Air National Guard looking at obsolescence of equipment here before we see replacement equipment. In the meantime, uh, we can make those, uh, that legacy equipment last uh, a little longer uh, with some modernization funds. Thank goodness for Ingria money because we use a lot of that to uh, modernize uh, our equipment. Although we look to the Air Force to modernize and, and equip us, we know that a lot of our needs fall below the funding line. Uh, and that's why Ingria is so important. Uh, our equipping levels uh, are steadily dropping. Uh, we're losing uh, the effectiveness of our uh, equipment. Uh, and I'm not necessarily talking about the aircraft. We have adequate aircraft to do the mission right now. Um, we have weapons uh, sustainment monies. Uh, we'll be able to fly the missions for a little while longer, but it's getting more difficult because these, uh, the, these jets and our rolling stock is getting older and older, more difficult to maintain. A lot of the parts are not in production anymore. A lot of our radar systems are old uh, mechanical scanned array as opposed to the new electronically scanned array. Um, and all that affects our uh, combat capability and our readiness. It's getting more and more difficult, more and more expensive uh, to maintain these, uh, these legacy uh, platforms. So we face the same problem that the Air Force does, except our stuff is just a little bit older and a little bit more in need of modernization. Congressman, if I could make a quick comment relative sure. to New Jersey and the recent uh, floods uh, that were sustained in New Jersey because of Hurricane Irene. The New Jersey National Guard was in a lot better shape to respond to that hurricane because of the modernized FMTVs that were available for use to respond to the requirements of the citizens of New Jersey. And I think uh, as you look at that, if they hadn't had the modern equipment that they did have on hand, uh, the response would have been a little bit more difficult and probably a little slower. So courtesy of this committee and the National Guard Reserve equipment account and the $37 billion that's been plowed into our equipment over the last six years, uh, it, it not only benefits the war fight, but it benefits people in the homeland. Congressman, if I could just put one more point on this particular discussion, because Negria is hugely important. Uh, the modernization pieces have all been talked about, but I think that there is uh, one perhaps unintended positive consequence in Negria, and that is that it's execution year dollars. It meets the urgent operational needs that come from combatant commanders, and in several cases, the Guard Reserve Test Center has responded to these urgent operational needs with, uh, with commercial off-the-shelf kinds of hardware and software that are able to be put on some of the airplanes that not only on Guard and Reserve, but started on Guard and Reserve airplanes and migrated to the active force. We can get that quicker uh, with Negria dollars, and you can get programma programmatically putting it into the, the funding streams, and it ends up migrating uh, that direction to the active force as well. Thank you all very much. I, Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Critz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, generals, for being here. Thank you for your service. For those in the uh, audience, thanks so much for being here with us, and thank you for your service. Um, General Carpenter, I just have one quick question for you, is that um, uh, the Department of the Army is going to divest itself of the Sherpas, the um, C-23s, and from my understanding, they've been used pretty extensively in theater, and I'm just curious as to what the plan is going forward and how, what the impact it will be uh, to the Army National Guard. Uh, because of the uh, resource management decision that was made uh, last year, uh, we are directed to divest ourselves of the C-23s uh, ending in, in FY15. We have actually parked four of them on the ramp in Texas right now, and they're no longer available for our use. Uh, there is, in my estimate, a gap that's created by parking those C-23s, both in the homeland and in the overseas uh, operations. Uh, as I mentioned uh, before uh, a different committee recently, uh, when we were in, a, in Iraq, uh, there were ten Sherpas that were deployed to Balad. Nine were on the ramp that evening, and all nine flew operations. And uh, the, the uh, information that I got was that the combatant commander was actually looking for more Sherpas to be able to use in that mission. We've got two Sherpas now that are flying observations in uh, MFO Sinai as in terms of the uh, peacekeeping force there. Uh, they are in the words of the ambassador and the uh, officials on the ground, the best aircraft that you could possibly have for that mission. In the homeland, uh, I'm a South Dakota Guardsman. Our C-23s flew pilots from North Dakota back and forth as they carried out the CAP mission 
CAP mission in the East Coast. And they ferried not only that, but they ferried uh, parts and, uh, and various supplies to New York as they dealt with 9-11. I think they provide a critical, a critical part of the homeland mission and do great service in the overseas mission. Uh, we're concerned about what does that leave in terms of the effect after we uh, after we've divested ourselves of all 15 of those or all uh, excuse me all 42 of those. Thank you, um, General Wyatt. Um, one thing that I just learned is that uh, you know we're hearing that the active air force is planning maybe planning significant retirements of uh, Air National Guard aircraft all C5As, F16, three F16 wings, 72 C130s, uh, many of which are under guard, and some uh, number of A10s, and then terminating, ac terminating acquisition of the C27J aircraft as a possible response to budget cuts. Um, has the Guard been actively involved or consulted regarding these cuts, and if so, how would the loss of these aircraft affect the Air National Guard? And then what alternative missions will those uh, men and women who operate those uh, platforms, uh, what other missions will they be able to do with the loss of those aircraft? The, uh, uh, the platforms that you've referenced, uh, a, a lot of those are flown exclusively by the Air National Guard, C-27 being, yeah. uh, being one of those. Uh, C-5As, uh, we have the two C-5A uh, wings remaining in the Air National Guard. I believe General Stenner has some, some C-5As in, in his fleet. Uh, when the Air Force leadership says that everything is on the table, I believe what the Air Force leadership says. Uh, I think it's too early in the, uh, uh, in the budgeting process to, to reach any conclusion as to what may or may not uh, survive, uh, and we're still looking at, you know, what is the total budget bogey going to be. But, uh, uh, you know, if those platforms were uh, removed from service uh, for whatever reason, budgetary or, or whatever, uh, in essence, what you would have is you would have the air being taken out of the Air National Guard. Yeah. Uh, there are other missions out there that we could certainly roll into, and we are already doing that. Remotely piloted aircraft, we already provide about 20 percent of, uh, of the total Air Force capability in remotely piloted aircraft. We would look to, to uh, see if we could uh, get more of that mission. Uh, cyber, uh, I believe, is one of the areas identified uh, uh, where the Department of Defense needs to uh, uh, to enhance its cyber capabilities, and we believe Air National Guardsmen are ideally suited for this role because a lot of our uh, citizen warriors already work for some of the big I IT and, and computer firms across the country. They are all already uh, cyber warriors in their civilian capacities, and and uh, those are the type of individuals that uh, would find cyber war fighting uh, a patriotic thing to do. So there are some things that we could do. Uh, to step into other mission sets. So we haven't talked about, uh, you know, Red Horse engineering, uh, communications, uh, security forces. There are some other things that we could do. But if we lost those airframes, in essence, you're taking the air out of the Air National Guard. And, and we're just, we're hearing about this, and that's why I'm, I'm curious, too. Are you part of any discussions about targeting certain airframes for possible retirement or, or um, well, the, lack of use? The Chief of Staff and the Secretary have both said that there are some difficult decisions that we will have to make. The Air Force does include the Air National Guard uh, and the Air Force Reserve into uh, decision-making processes. And uh, uh, General Stenner and I have cast our votes. Uh, I don't know what the, uh, the final verdict is going to be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sir, if I could just add also, from the Army's, or at least from my perspective, uh, that has a huge impact on us because originally we had part of the C-27 program designed to take the load off our CH-47s. And then we handed it over entirely to the Air Force. Our CH-47s, our aviation, are some of the highest op tempo. We're flying the blades off of those things. And if we don't get the C-27s to take the load off, of, it's going to have a significant impact on our CH-47 fleet. Thank you very much, Mr. Platts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll be brief. A number of my questions have been addressed, and especially uh, the one regarding the impact on, on all the military, especially our Guard and Reserve units, if uh, sequestration of $1.2 or more occurs come January, and your frankness in assessing that 
is I think critical important to uh, this committee and to the full House and Senate understand the importance of avoiding that and that the 400 billion plus are already taken out of defense is uh, going to create some hardships as is let alone more another 600 billion um, the other uh, just comment of, of gratitude uh, certainly interact with the guard and reserve units um, in my district or close by a lot with 193rd special ops uh, uh, don't have the privilege of, of hosting the base, but uh, many of their pilots and uh, air crews uh, support personnel are in my district and uh, and with the Guard and Reservists. Um, in my 11 visits to Iraq and 8 to Afghanistan, see firsthand the amazing work they're doing and uh, your leadership and advocacy for those men and women is um, so important. And I, I think the, all the more important because of the fiscal challenges facing us and you know whether it's one third, one six, a quarter, whatever the savings number is. Uh, you know we know we have a absolute professional soldier, airman, out there uh, at a fraction of the cost, uh, but when we need them. Uh, so uh, what you and and your uh, officers and and soldiers and airmen are doing is uh, much appreciated, and um, you know we as a nation are indebted to you. So with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, General Carpenter, what percent of the uh, Army uh, fighting capabilities represented by the uh, Army National Guard? Uh, Mr. Chairman, 40% uh, of the operational uh, force of the Army is resident in the Army National Guard. Inside of the Army National Guard uh, formations, 51% of our formations are combat brigades and combat aviation brigades, combat organizations. Uh, thank you. Um, General Wyatt, a similar number for the uh, Air National Guard. Mr. Chairman, we, uh, we have about 34 percent of the uh, okay. uh, combat capability of the, of the Air Force. You can break that down. Uh, tankers around 43 uh, percent. C-130 lift about 30 percent, perhaps 29, just a little bit below that. Uh, Fighter aircraft, uh, about uh, 32 to 33 uh, percent. RPA I mentioned um, about 20 percent. Uh, cyber is kind of hard to to count because we're we're still in the early stages in the Air Force of standing up uh, uh, cyber units and the capabilities that the Air Force needs to uh, uh, to lend its support to national defense. Uh, but a large portion. Uh, depending upon how you count combat communications, uh, perhaps up to 10 to 11 percent of our total force uh, could be uh, interpreted being in cyber already. So we see that as an opportunity to uh, contribute to the defense of the, this country. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, General Stultz, uh, U.S. Army Reserve, what percent? Well, sir, we have a um relatively small percentage of the combat force because I have one light infantry battalion which is out in the Pacific, Guam, Saipan, Samoa. Uh, overall, what is your percentage, would you say? But our, our percentage of, we have 205,000 soldiers in the Army Reserve out of the 1.1 million force. And of the combat support, service support, on average, I would say we're a full third of that force. But we've also got another force that we really never talk about very much, and that's in the generating force. I have 48,000 soldiers that are part of the Army's generating force. I have the training divisions that do the basic training mission at places like Fort Jackson, South Carolina, Fort Benning, Georgia, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. The drill sergeants that are down there training active duty guard and reserve soldiers. I have the AIT battalions that are training them in their MOS skills. I have the 75th Battle Training Division that does the mission command training for the Army in the warfighter exercises. So a huge piece of the Army's generating force is coming from my force as well as the operational force. So you start putting those together and it gets somewhere around 33 to 40 percent, sir. Uh, General Stenner, a uh, similar number for the Air Force Reserve. Yes, sir. If you break it down by mission set, it's uh, as I've depicted it here on this board. But as an overall number, uh, very briefly, I would have to say it's approaching 20 percent. 20 percent. Okay. I would. Uh, these numbers are pretty big for the uh, for the Army. They're something like 73 to 80 percent of the total fighting force is represented in the Guard and Reserve. Since it's very much uh, less expensive to uh, 
to maintain capabilities in guard and reserve. Obviously, the bigger the percentage the guard and reserve is of the total fighting force, the less it's going to cost us. But um, there are limits to that, and I just wanted to get a number from each of you, and I would like for you to, uh, to write that number down so you're not influenced by your neighbor's response, and they will ask you for that number. Uh, with due consideration to training and integration, what total percent of our fighting capability could be resident in guard and reserve if we're up against tight budget constraints and want to get the most for our dollar? If you would just write that figure down. I know you're either in the guard or the reserve, but if you will, for now, combine the guard and reserve in your, in, in your uh, uh, answer and give you a moment to write that down, then I'll just go down the line and ask you for, uh, for the number that you have, uh, uh, have written down. Okay, General Stoltz, what number have you written down? I wrote down 65%, sir. Well, you already had eight, 73 to 80%. Yes, sir. I'm, what I'm taking into account is that we, we right now, out of a 1.1 million man force, the Guard and Reserve make up a little over 50% of that force in the total force. So right. if you Ask were to say what could we be, yeah. I would say more along a, a 60, 40, 65, Are you talking about only the Reserve now or Guard and Because the answers I got... No, uh, sir, I'm talking about guard and reserve combined. General Carpenter told me that 40% of the fighting capabilities represented by the uh, guard, and you told me that 33 to 40, if I add those up, it's somewhere between 73 and 80% already is represented by guard and reserve. But I'm, I'm talking about the combat so support, service support. And I'm not sure if he's talking about the combat arms. I, it, see, that's where you, when you start talking about the fighting force and what I make up of that, I make up the service support side of it, not the combat side of it. Okay, and that's how much bigger than the current number? You're 60-some, 63 percent? Well, I said we, we currently today, uh, today between the Guard and Reserve, we make up a little over 50 percent of the Army's force. And you think that could grow from 50 to 65? Yes, sir, 60 to 65 percent. Okay. And I, I think part of that's going to happen as we come down from okay. 569 to 520 to whatever number. If we just stay the same, it's going okay. to change that balance. Um, General... Uh, Let's see, um, General Carpenter, what number did you write down? I feel like I'm uh, taking an open book test here a little bit. <laughs> uh, but you know, the total already that you gave me was, was 64 percent. Uh, uh, 34 uh, and, I'm sorry, 54 percent, 34 and 20, 54 percent. And uh, let me qualify this a little bit. It goes back to uh, Secretary Gates's comment about being able to predict the future. And part of the discussion here has to be what risk are we willing to take as we look at uh, a very unpredictable and very dangerous mm -hmm. world. Post-Iraq, post-Afghanistan, uh, the number I wrote down is 70 percent. But I have to tell you, you need to make sure you understand the risk associated I understand the higher that number is, the, uh, the higher the risk is. A yeah. Absolutely. I understand that. Okay, okay. And that's something we'd have to factor. We would have to, uh, uh, have to factor uh, uh, in. Uh, General Wyatt, what was your number? Uh, at the risk of sounding greedy, I had 100%, but I thought that uh, <laughs> uh, probably... That'd be uh, nice. <laughs> Uh, I, I think a lot, uh, a lot would uh, depend upon the particular mission set that you're talking about. Certainly there are some mission sets in the Air Force that are better suited to the Guard and the Reserve. Uh, other mission sets that uh, where the uh, active duty is, is more suitable. When, and I touched on this a little bit earlier when I was talking about uh, warfighting UTCs. That's our specialty, uh, is warfighting UTCs. Uh, we don't do very good acquisitions. We don't do very good research, development, test, and evaluation. We don't. We do some special operations. We do some special operations with the 193rd SOW, uh, Special Operations Wing in Pennsylvania. Uh, but that's not our, our forte. Those folks are very, very good, but we, we don't have large numbers of those types of special forces. Uh, space. Uh, we do some space, but a lot of those space missions are 24 hours a day, 365. It really doesn't fit the guard, guard construct. So I think you have to, uh, you know, if you were looking, if you asked me, you know, how much uh, higher headquarters research and development acquisition should the Guard do, I would say probably zero. 
but when we're talking about the type of capability that the country needs to ramp up for a fight and then ramp down for a fight and then ramp up for a fight, you're talking about combat uh, unit training codes in the United States Air Force. And I think that uh, the, the appropriate answer in my mind would be 60 to 65 percent of okay. that capability. Good. Thank you very much. General Stenner. Yes, sir. If, uh, if I could qualify this by saying I need to go find my A-9 analyst and see if we can't uh, <laughs> come up with a – but I will qualify it with some assumptions. Uh, first of all, if we continue with the same uh, concepts we have within the Air Force right now, we're trained to the same standards, we're seamlessly integrated, we can deploy within 72 hours, maintaining those kinds of, of uh, assumptions, maintaining a baseline uh, book of uh, 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 a number of MPA dollars that we can, in fact, access, and that is a big concern of our, our active force compatriots, is the access to the Guard and Reserve. And I read access to mean military personnel appropriation dollars that give us into the exercises, into the senior security packages. Doing all those kinds of things and getting it right in the baseline, I, I, and again with the qualifiers on the institutional force, I, I threw 50 percent uh, on the table. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I want to um, note my appreciation for the uh, questions and answers relative to the C-27J. I've been concerned for a number of years that that was an airplane which the Army wanted and had considerable need for. In their wisdom, the Pentagon gave that plane to the Air Force and then asked the Air Force to please be Johnny on the spot when the Army needed them. That was not anticipated to work very well. I'm not sure that is working very well. I do not believe that this program has been adequately resourced, and I'm very appreciative that we got those, that question and answer without me asking the question uh, to, to, to get the answer. Uh, thank you all uh, very much. Uh, because we want to make sure that we have all the information that may be necessary to, uh, to make certain that we make the best possible case for uh, uh, making sure that you have all that you need in the future, there may be questions that we will need to ask for the record. So if you could respond to those, we'd be very appreciative of that. Thank you all very much for your testimonies. Thank you, um, members of the subcommittee, for coming. The committee, subcommittee now stands in adjournment. <laughs>